As always, I'm grateful that you joined me. This is Professor Jared Rathel, and I have to tell you right from the start that Lesson 3-5 is one of my all-time faves. So today we'll be exploring the rise of animal diversity on planet Earth. So let's start with the goblin shark. This is a deep sea shark. It's called a living fossil because its lineage stretches back 125 million years. It's a pink skinned shark that can grow to lengths of 13 feet. It's clearly a predator. So it has this elongated flattened snout that is lined with ampullae of Lorenzini. These are specialized electroreceptors that allow this predator to detect the electromagnetic fields of the beating hearts of its prey. Further, it's got highly extendable jaws and lots of needle-like teeth. So this is clearly a predator. It's adaptations like these that have driven further adaptations in its prey resulting in an evolutionary arms race between predators and prey, which drove and is still driving the explosion of animal diversity that we see today. So the great British poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, aptly describes nature as red and tooth and claw. So hopefully you watched the short video that preceded this lecture and you saw the gauntlet that newly hatched Galapagos marine iguanas have to navigate in order to avoid a whole uh, mass of six foot long Galapagos racer snakes. As you saw, sometimes the predator wins, sometimes the snake wins, and sometimes the little iguana gets away. Sometimes the prey wins. So as gruesome as Mother Nature is, it is out of these relationships, out of these predator-prey dynamics that evolves the myriad of animal forms that we see today. The kingdom Animalia evolved from single-celled, animal-like, heterotrophic protists, similar to the extant coanoflagellates. As we discussed in a previous lecture, the coanoflagellates offer us insight into the evolution of multicellularity in the animals. These coanoflagellates spend part of their lives as unicellular independent cells doing their own thing and part of their lives working cooperatively in colonies. The sponges the simplest and oldest animals on the planet are truly multicellular. They're comprised of coanocytes, which are very, very similar structurally to the coanoflagellates, as well as the amoeba-like amoebocyte cells, which are found in sponges, mollusks, and starfish. The first animals evolve in our oceans more than 700 million years ago during the Ediacaran period. The first animals were multicellular filter feeders preying on microscopic plankton. Some were sessile, fixed to the ocean floor like modern day sea fans, and other of these animals drifted with the current like today's jellyfish. So this world, 700 million years ago, was a relatively safe world. It was a time before jaws with teeth and electroreceptors and claws and body armor. And then, boom, everything changes in a metaphorical explosion of animal body plans. From 545 to 525 million years ago, animal life radiates into a mind-boggling array of different body plans. We initially learned about the Cambrian explosion 
from an incredibly rich fossil site discovered in the Canadian Rockies in British Columbia, known as the Burgess Shale. The predator-prey evolutionary arms race had begun. So the primary consumers during the Cambrian period were the trilobites. The trilobites are the earliest arthropods. Arthropods are, of course, a phylum that are in abundance today. They're characterized by hard exoskeletons, multiple body segments, as well as jointed limbs. Thus far, there have been over 20,000 species of trilobites recovered and described. But those Cambrian oceans weren't an easy life for the trilobites. Meet Anomalo Caris, the first large predator of the oceans of planet Earth. So for this time period, Anomalo Caris was gigantic. Fossilized remains indicate this thing grew to be 3.3 feet long. It propelled itself through the water with these side flaps that would undulate. So Cambrian trilobites have been recovered with W-shaped bite marks in them that match the mouth parts of Anomalocaris. We have stronger evidence still that Anomalocaris preyed on these trilobites because we've recovered coprolites, which are fossilized feces that contained the bits and pieces of trilobites. And these coprolites were so big that this is the only species that could have made them. So as the predators evolved, so did the prey. Hallucigenia, aptly named, was originally reconstructed upside down. Paleontologists originally thought that these structures here were legs, but additional fossil recoveries demonstrated that this these spikes were clearly body armor, probably evolved to keep predators like Anomalocaris at bay. We certainly see this same strategy evolve again and again throughout the evolutionary history of time, right? Think about Stegosaurus or porcupines and hedgehogs today. Ovadio vermis was a filter-feeding worm-like creature. It had nine pairs of legs that it probably used to get up to high vantage points to feed. There have been 101 specimens of Herpatogaster recovered. So this thing secured itself to the seafloor with an extendable anchor and then likely fed by uh, snagging, drifting prey and plankton with its tentacles and then bringing those tentacles to its mouth, similar to the way feather stars and sea cucumbers do it today. And that brings us to my all-time favorite Cambrian creature, the wild and weird Opa Binia. So the fossil evidence clearly demonstrates that Opa Binia had, and you can count them, five eyes, five compound eyes, as well as this flexible elephant-like proboscis that it probably used to search for prey on the seafloor. Opa Binia brings me to a really important point. The Cambrian explosion represents this incredible time of evolutionary experimentation when lots of different body plans and adaptations arise, many of which are ultimately selected against and die out. So we don't see five compound eyes on any creatures alive today. One lineage that did not die out, thankfully, is Milo Cumingia. Milo Cumingia is an incredibly important fossil find. Milo Cumingia is the first animal that we see that has a notochord. A notochord is a cartilaginous rod 
that um, develops along the dorsal side of the chordates. This notochord is what develops into the vertebral column or the backbone in vertebrates. Further, Mylocumingia has a skull that is made of cartilage. This astounding fossil is thought to be the ancestor of the fish and ultimately of us. What about these monsters? These must be Cambrian creatures from 500 million years ago, right? Nope. These are all creatures that live among us today. The sand hopper on the top left. On the bottom left, we have triops or the brine shrimp. It's often called sea monkeys and uh, packaged and sold in the store. You can get triops eggs. And then my favorite over here on the right, that's a giant marine isopod. So it's a cousin of the roly polies that you used to catch as kids, except these giant isopods grow up to 14 inches long and can weigh as much as 3.7 pounds. So these animals have a lot to teach us about the underlying genetics that drove the evolution of animal body plans during the Cambrian explosion. Hox genes and the evolution of animal body plans. Animals have a variety of body plans. Flies have six legs, mice have four, and millipedes have many. Scientists have proposed that changes in a group of similar genes called the Hox genes have created the diverse animal body plans we have today. To test this hypothesis, our lab has focused on crustaceans. Crustaceans are an excellent group of animals for studying body plan evolution because they have many different body plans. By examining Hox genes in crustaceans, we can understand how these genes have changed to produce new body plans. In particular, our lab focuses on the sandhopper. Let's stretch out the sandhopper body plan so we can see each segment. The sandhopper has antennae, many mouth parts, claws, forward walking legs, reverse walking legs, swimming legs, and anchoring legs. First, we figured out where each of the Hox genes is turned on. Then we deleted each of these Hox genes to see how this would affect the animal's body plan. For example, if you delete the Hox gene called abdominal A, the animal's backwards walking legs turn into forward walking legs, and the animal's swimming legs turn into anchoring legs. This means that abdominal A is necessary for making backwards walking legs and swimming legs. The portion of the body that turns on the abdominal A gene has changed over evolutionary time. If we look at other types of crustaceans, such as shrimp and pill bugs, we can see that the part of the body that turns on abdominal A has changed. This change leads to a difference in the body plan of these other crustaceans. Currently, we are starting to determine what is responsible for the changes in where abdominal A is turned on. By figuring out how this change happened, we can develop a better picture of how the Hox genes have changed over evolutionary time to produce new body plans. And how are those researchers able to systematically knock out Hox genes using a tool that you learned about, CRISPR? So I want to take a couple of minutes here and introduce evolutionary developmental biology, or EvoDevo for short. It's a new biological discipline that compares the developmental processes of different organisms looking closely at these Hox genes to infer the ancestral relationships between them and how these developmental processes evolved. So I like to think about these Hox genes as the conductor in an orchestra of development. These very important and highly conserved genes, meaning they don't mutate all that often, coordinate the development of the organism segment by segment, vertebrae by vertebrae. So they switch on and switch off developmental genes the way an orchestral conductor right, will fire up the cellos followed by the violins. Genetically modifying these Hox genes 
can induce radical morphological change. For example, mutating a Drosophila fruit fly hawk's gene can cause the organism to grow legs where it would normally grow antennas. So underlying mutations in these Hawks genes is what likely drove the radiation of all this great diversity of animal body plans that we observe in the fossil record during the Cambrian explosion. All right, we're going to conclude this lesson today by mapping the major milestones in animal evolution. You're going to see a very similar diagram, a very similar phylogenetic tree on your next assessment. At the base of the tree, we have that ancestral protist. Remember, it's a lot like the present-day coanoflagellates. This is when we become true animals, members of the kingdom Animalia, with the evolution of multicellularity. So all of the lineages downstream of here are multicellular. The sponges, the porphyria, are the first branch to diverge from the animal tree. So these guys lack true tissues. Remember, a tissue is a group of specialized cells that work together and perform a function. The nadaria, downstream of tissues here, are the first lineage to have true tissues. The nadaria have these nematocyst, specialized enzyme-producing stinging cells. If you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you've been hit by a little harpoon-like nematocyst. The jellyfish use these to subdue and digest their prey. It says something about animal life that the some of the earliest tissues that we see are stinging cells. Moving on down the branch of the animal tree, here we hit bilateral symmetry. So everything downstream is bilaterally symmetric. The nadaria, the jellyfish, are radially symmetric. So the difference between radial and bilateral symmetry is illustrated here. A radially symmetric organism, like a jellyfish, if you look down on the bell from above, it can be split with any number of different planes of symmetry, like spokes on a wheel. But when you look at a flatworm or a squirrel, it has this plane of symmetry that splits it right down the middle, like you see in me, with a right eye and a left eye, a right ear and a left ear right hand, left hand. I'm bilaterally symmetric. We're going to talk about the importance of bilateral symmetry in our next unit when we talk about cephalization. But what bilateral symmetry allows now is for the development of an anterior and a posterior, a head and a tail. And as soon as you have a head, then you can begin to concentrate neurons in your anterior. The coelom here the coelom is a specialized body cavity containing a digestive tract. So organisms downstream of the coelom are going to have a one-way gut with a mouth and an anus. And then lastly, the last thing I want to point out here is the evolution of the notochord on the lineage that is to become the chordata. So the notochord, as we previously discussed, was present in Milo Kunmingia. Uh, it's this cartilaginous uh, skeletal rod that ends up developing into the vertebral column in the true vertebrates. Lot presented here, but for your assessment, you will need to uh, appropriately place the following evolutionary milestones: multicellularity true tissues, radial and bilateral symmetry, the coelom, and the notochord. Okay, so make sure if you're presented with a diagram like this that you can appropriately place those evolutionary milestones. 
My next lecture is also a good one. It's going to focus on the impact of mass extinctions and the resultant adaptive radiations. So please tune in.